Sam Slater from Fun Calibre, and today I've been joined by Juliet Schooling Latter and Darius McDermott. We're going to discuss the big themes of the second quarter of this year. So perhaps we can start looking at the best performing funds over the past three months. We had a quick look and it's actually been Brazilian equities and European real estate that have been the best performers. Um, any ideas why that is? Well, I have to say, when you posed this question to me, I had to scratch my head a little bit because Brazilian equities wouldn't have jumped off the page at me. But then, you know, taxing my brain a little as I have to occasionally, I try to think about it a little bit. And one of the dominating themes in markets at the moment is inflation. And Brazil is it tends to do well in inflationary periods. Um, the other factor is oil has been quite strong. It's now in the mid seventy dollars per barrel, and Brazil is an oil producer. But also, it produces lots of other commodities like paper and packaging, and um, chickens. And with a broad reopening trade, maybe that's what's driving Brazil in the short term. They're still in a bit of a mess with COVID. Their leader has had some interesting Trump-esque type policies. But I think this looks like an inflation play uh, to me. Um, I think think it is an area um, that is very risky. And, you know, investors need to be aware of that. I mean, you know, the politics, um, as Darius mentioned, uh, isn't great there. And uh, you, you know, there's there's so, quite a lot of social discontent, and uh, this is not being aided by the fact that they're they're in the grip of of, of a really bad drought, um, which is causing yeah. water shortages and uh, power blackouts. Um, and obviously, this sort of coming on top of COVID has not um, has not helped, and and obviously doesn't help with the uh, with the sort of social discontent aspect either. Yeah, and the other area that you mentioned, Sam, is European real estate. And this is quite niche, but actually a really interesting way of playing, um, of playing property as a, as a broad theme. So the fund that I know we looked at was the BMO European Real Estate Fund. That invests primarily in Europe, but, but the UK as well, in listed property companies. There's a huge debate going on about the liability matching between illiquid assets like property and open-ended funds. And whilst I don't wish to send our listeners to sleep with any great depth on the subject, one way to play property, particularly in UK and Europe, is via the BMO, European Property Real Estate. It invests a big chunk in things like German residential. On the continent, there is far less property ownership and far more property renting as a culture. And you get um, these fixed rate increases, often linked to inflation. There's the I word for the second time. And I think with the reopening feeling that, you know, this is just one of those sectors which property did poorly in the pandemic. And it is coming back. And this is a a fine way of paying an illiquid asset in an open-ended fund. Um, we're also halfway through the year now, so um, we also had a look at the figures for the first six months of the year, so a slightly longer time frame, although pretty short term still. And energy funds were the top performers there as well, which I'm presuming is a similar story to what you've just talked about with Brazil. Um, but UK smaller companies are up there too. What's the story behind our small caps? Well, I think smaller companies have been uh, you, you know the uk in general and uk smaller companies have been unloved uh, really since 2016 due to brexit you know markets hate uncertainty and obviously you know the the uk with the deal no deal etc has has been um in a state of 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 uncertainty um and we were actually quite positive on them sort of towards the end of 2019, you know, as the negotiations came to an end and there was more clarity for businesses. But then, of course, the pandemic hit. But fast forward and, you know, our vaccine rollout's been really, really good. And, uh, you know, we've we've got rid of the Brexit uncertainty. And I think investors are returning to the to the UK market. Yeah, I think 
just to finish off on UK smaller companies, this is one of the world's least guarded secrets, particularly here uh, at Fund Calibre. We bang on about small companies all the time. And Sam, you and I did some work three years after the referendum, before the sort of Boris, um, you know, heavily victory in December 19. And even then, when the UK market was totally unloved, UK smaller companies had well and truly performed better than UK larger companies, which was counterintuitive to us. So UK smaller companies, whilst clearly having the liquidity risk that you get, but you also get paid for the liquidity premium. And I think particularly in the UK, but many other regions, smaller companies should be a decent portion of your weighting in an individual geography. Oil, I think, is slightly easier. Oil in Q1 of 2020 for two reasons. There was a bit of a, a scrap between the Saudis and the Russians on oil and supply. Then we had um, the pandemic. Well, all of a sudden, nobody's doing anything. There's no travel. So you su to, to supply demand, and the demand for oil went through the floor. Uh, so oil just went to like long-term record lows, $10, $20. And here we are a year later, and it's $70. And it's that slight lag of that increased oil price fixed, filtering through to oil companies and the supply chain within oil that, that, that have seen energy funds um, do so well. And you've mentioned inflation a couple of times now. So we're, we've seen it continue to rise. In the US, it's now 5%. What's your view on it? Do you think it's going to be something that's going to stick around for the long term? Or is it just this transitory period on sort of looking back on this time last year and when nothing was happening? Well, I think, um, I mean, it, it, inflation was always going to tick up, as you say, because it was such a low base a year ago. And and we were relatively relaxed because um, we, we thought it was a temporary blip. I'm becoming a little concerned that the blip might be slightly more drawn out, you know, because um, you've got this sort of dramatic rise in the cost of shipping sort of brought about due to the pandemic um, and ships being in the wrong place uh, and this is going to take quite a long time to sort of iron out and that's obviously um, adding cost into businesses and also we've got sort of wages tipping up ticking up you know uh, the hospitality industry is struggling to find staff when they reopen I do think is a little more short term I think there is seasonal issues and you know, there are a decent percentage of people in the hospitality industry on furlough, which still hasn't ended. And universities are just finishing for the summer. I, I guess there will be some student labour enter the market uh, over the period. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Hospitality is struggling to get full employment to deal with the July the 19th reopening day when, um, you know, venues can be at fuller capacities. But yeah, with the inflation is, I think, that this, uh, the subject we discussed the most and what implication it has on other assets. We were recently talking with Steve Snowden, who's the uh, manager of the elite-rated Artemis Corporate Bond Fund, and he was very much of it. Yes, it may be sticky for six or 12 more months, but actually, given that he's a bond manager and bonds generally do bad in rising inflation, the Fed have pointed to raising rates in 2023. And as he rightly pointed out, if we get two rate raises in the US, it will go to a whole 0.75 interest rate. It's still at record lows. And whilst you two are both far too young to remember, inflation above 10% in the 70s and 80s was actually quite common. And even in the noughties and the early uh, 2010s, inflation in the UK at three, four and five whilst above the 2% target was absolutely the norm. So certainly something to be watched, certainly something to be mindful of, but we are broadly not in that it's going to 5 to 10% and it's going to stay there. That's the way the evidence looks to us, I think, today. And to you know, a lot of fund managers we talk to actually take the counter view, I might add. Uh, I think it's fair to say. Some of them are very bearish on what inflation might mean for both equities and bonds. So... We're not being ignorant of it. We're certainly being mindful of it. But uh, as we stand today, I think it, you know, it's a bit more stubborn than we thought six, eight months ago. But uh, yeah, not not endemic long term hyperinflation, I don't think. 
And, and don't forget, I mean, you know, actually, the gov- for governments, it's a bit of a sweet spot at the moment because they've got low interest rates for for their for their debt, um, but a bit of inflation because they're, they're, you know, governments post COVID are up to their ears in debt uh, and having it sort of inflated away is, 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 is what they need really. And one of the other things you guys have been talking about in the investment committee is big tech. Now the consensus seems to be that, you know, the big, the Amazons, all those types of stocks have got pretty expensive, but actually there's been some discussion that their earnings are okay and they could continue to do well. What, what have you been talking about there? Yeah, and technology again has just been such a dominant sector, um, both pre and post pandemic. Like lots of sectors, technology is also a very broad sector. It's not just, you know, even Amazon actually isn't qualified as a technology company. It's qualified as a consumer company. Uh, when I think most of us feel of it, it is a technology business. Technology is changing the world. It is what disruption is all about. And who's to say that some of these businesses can't disrupt for longer? What's more, their earning power is phenomenal. You know, they sell more computers and more chips and more platform space and Zoom and advertising. And all that means is they keep building up more and more cash. So if anybody is clever and comes along with some technology to just to disrupt them, they just buy them and you know, bring it into their own sort of sphere. So... Again, another subject we do debate, Julia, I know has always been a, a long-term tech bull. Um, yes, I bought I bought tech in, in, in junior ice as many years ago, which has which has done quite well, actually. And you know, you have to look beneath the surface to see if a company's actually expensive. Um, you know, as Darius said, you know, big tech's got excellent sort of long-term secular growth trends. And it's got much faster growth and it's just sort of slightly more expensive than the market. But with those sort of strong balance sheets and, uh, you know, with valuations that are likely overstated, given they're based on sort of quite conservative um, analyst estimates. Um, yeah, it's the it, earnings part, isn't it, of the, yeah, the yeah. PE equation. The earnings is the bit that keeps surprising. And certainly in Q1, the Big tech company earnings were far bigger than than the Wall Street had predicted, and hence they sit nicely on those slightly elevated, slightly elevated valuations, but with huge cash generation and huge cash conversion. You've got to be if you how you how do you disrupt Microsoft? I mean, they're in part of everybody's IT life, even if you use a different computer brand or whatever, you've probably still got some Microsoft cloud. It, you know, it, it's everywhere. And it's a bit like Apple. They're just part of people's lives and it doesn't look likely to change. Now, that's where the, as I say, if, if, if newer technologies and, and devices come along, the likes of Apple or Amazon with these massive cash, I mean, they've got tens and tens of billions of US dollars sitting there. If somebody's any good, they're just going to buy them and incorporate it into their own space. So it is a bit of a, say monopoly some of these businesses but they are huge and apple's bigger than the whole of the european stock market by market cap or something like that it's it's yeah phenomenal and going maybe from expensive to cheap one of the things that we've seen here in the uk is an increase in merger and acquisitions with some foreign buyers actually looking to pick up some uk companies at some very good prices we've had uh, morrison's takeover bid recently we've also had companies coming to market with IPOs like Moonpick. What's your thoughts around that area? Well, I'll have a word on IPOs and then maybe, sorry, on M&A and then let Juliet talk about IPOs. But the interesting thing about M&A is it's coming from three channels. It's coming from overseas buyers. It's coming from private equity. And it's also coming from other UK companies buying their rivals. So it really is hotting up. I think uh, companies that were looking to buy each other maybe in the last year with the pandemic or overseas are are accelerating that trend and i think it it that's visible in the ipo market as well yes i mean i think i think it's likewise for ipos is basically there's there's just been a sort of a backlog um uh you know um last year was uh, such such a write off for companies and and um i think they've uh, they've taken advantage this year and are coming to the market and uh with sort of renewed investor confidence and optimism as things open up, um, they're doing quite well. 
Uh, and I know a number of our managers have uh, taken advantage of some of them. Um, we were talking earlier today to uh, James Baker at Chelverton, um, who has um, been investing in some. Um, so I think that's, again, positive for the UK market. That's great. Thank you very much. And if you'd like to listen to more of our podcasts, please go to fancaliber.com and subscribe via your usual channels. Please remember we've been discussing individual stocks to bring investing to life for you. It's not a recommendation to buy or to sell. The fund may or may not still hold these stocks at the time of your listening.